Thank you, Praise Pastor. You. Bless you. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise Pastor Bothman, right? Am I, am I good? Okay. okay. you got to forgive me. My English is not my first language, so it's got a little Italian flavor in it. And, uh, well, good to be here with all of you. Thank you for coming. And uh, what a great um, chance to get together. Get a, I've been to Phoenix many times preaching in uh, this state, but the first time I get to be with Brother Buffman and the First Lady. And my wife loves these people. I told them, I told them on our way from the airport, I said, man, you must have been really good back then. <laughs> so what happened now? No, just kidding. So, uh, and then as he just said, they knew my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, who were missionaries. And I'm a missionary product. I was saved through the ministry. I forgot to tell you that, for the ministry of uh, Mervyn Miller. You probably know him. Who doesn't know Mervyn Miller? Yeah, that's right. And so he calls me son in the, in, in the Lord. And, uh, and of course, well, I end up marrying a missionary girl as a revenge. <laughs> Somebody save me. No, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. So good to be here. And I'm excited about what the Lord is going to do this weekend. And uh, tomorrow night we're going to have our meeting together. I travel the states, of course, and overseas a little bit, bit. and one, this is one of the things we share, and uh, with the people, uh, uh, we, have, we, we offer several men, uh, uh, seminars, and um, I'm working on a PhD on uh, leadership, organizational leadership, that's what I love to do the most, but been in the ministry 32 years, I'm not look young, but I'm, that, I'm old, and, um, and I pastor two churches, we started one of them. And, uh, and I, throughout the years, these little seminars that I have planned to, uh, I think I sent you a list of it, uh, I plan to share with the people we have done this throughout the years, really is a summary of what I've learned uh, traveling. And it's a little um, drop of, of uh, understanding in, in this big galaxy of God's moving, doing its thing. And I was telling pastor, actually on our way here, um, altar working is really a tremendous tool. We have underestimated the, the ability of altar workers at the altar. And also we have underestimated the ministry of it, which, by the way, it's all Bible related because in the Old Testament, there were altar workers preparing uh, the work for the priest. So this is all in the Bible. But, and, uh, but sometimes, it's, in fact, I was telling him, we don't really try to teach people or share with people um, the idea that we know how for people to get the Holy Ghost, that's not necessarily what it's about. It's about avoiding mistakes and errors at the altar that it impedes or uh, uh, somehow hinders the ability of the seeker to find the Holy Ghost. That's all we do. We check for errors. If somebody comes and is no praying, it ain't going to happen. If somebody comes and has not repented, it's not going to happen. If somebody comes and doesn't open his mouth, it's not going to happen. Now, I've been in many churches, uh, and I've, I'm telling you, there's a, um, a seminar that we teach. It's called the Seven Dynamics of Revival. Because every pastor asks me, well, you've been there. You've been to these large churches. So what do you see that they have done? And I say sometimes things like altar work is excellent, and people really learn to help others to get the Holy Ghost and be blessed. And it's, a, it's more than that. And I said, these are some of the keys element in some of these revival churches. So I'm going to ex be excited about it more. Make sure you be here. It's going to be good. And uh, you're going to fill in the blank. It's going to be great. And then Sunday, of course, we got this great, I didn't know, Memorial Weekend is this kind of little, um, uh, you know, of course, it's a little detrimental to what we are doing. But God knows, and we will. We will just trust the Lord. Praise God. Well, good to be here. Good to meet the pastor. And I'm excited about what the Lord is doing. I, um, um, I want to take you to the word of the Lord tonight. And um, I'm going to just uh, stick with the theme, if I can, um, and uh, kind of maybe uh, give a little um, uh kind of share a little glimpse of what the Holy Ghost is all about. But I want to take you to the book of Luke chapter 1, 
verse 26. Praise God. And, um, and we're going to read a very, very common passage of Scripture. And um, you probably know this by heart. Verse 26, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. It shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, thou shalt this be, seeing I know not a man. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. Praise God. Lord, I love you. Thank you. I pray that you will continue to um, do a work today in this place. I pray that you'll touch every woman, every man, every young person. I pray to God that your anointing will continue to flow in this place uh, to facilitate what you're going to do in this place. God, I pray that you open up our minds and I pray that your anointing will fall on us. I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Praise God. Now, I'm a very kind of um, deceiving creature because I look very composed and, uh, you know, how can I say that? Um, and maybe dignified, but in a moment I'm fixing to lose everything you think I am and I get really wild. Um, you know, there is a, there is a, a a doctrine in the Bible, uh, the doctrine of uh, a sound um, that can be truly um, understood only when we uh, understand the power behind it. And the sound, uh, the same sound that preceded Pentecost was very, very important because the sound that is in, um, is related or actually is defined in the word of God is more than just a sound. It has, has to do with a heavenly dynamic that is necessary for a breakthrough. And the people, a lot of people have a hard time to understand that a sound of praise, a sound of worship is important, but it really is. Um, in fact, if you um, enjoy, how many enjoy history? You write, you'd like to read a little history in there. I don't, I'm not a scholar. I just enjoy reading and uh, get myself in trouble. But if you read the history of the Roman Empire and the, uh, the way the Roman Empire, of course, fell and declined, um, you, you learn a lot. But one thing you're going to learn is that the Roman Empire was really conquered, not by a great force, not by a great um, empire, were just Vikings, just I mean, they were just uh, uh, wild folks, and, uh, and they had no um, organized system, but they were wild, they were warriors, they were champions, they were trained in war, um, and, and they didn't know much as much as the Romans knew about combat. But I tell you one thing that they did, and they didn't do that on purpose. It, they just didn't know that this very thing that they used will defeat the greatest army ever lived. And I say the greatest because I'm Italian. I like the Romans to be the greatest. And uh, now you say, well, what about the Greece? Ah. And, and 
No, they were really powerful. But, but the, the truth is that historians tell us that before the combat and the conflict would take place, a sound was preceded before the battle will initiate. And this sound was a, a major scream. I mean, a scream that came from the truly inner side of these wild people. That was their uh, cry to, to battle. They cried to victory. The Romans didn't have that. But the Vikings had it. They were just wild people. That's the way they will do it. And if you read um, carefully what the historian says, he is this. This is blow me, it blows me away. That the sound of these Vikings truly terrorized some of the greatest warriors ever lived. Just the sound of it will terrorize them. Because the sound expressed um, a, 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 a fearful um, well, I would say express a defined conviction that they were going to war, that they were going to war, and they were going to win. And it was translated through the sound. And the Romans understood these people are not going to back off. These people are not going. This, this Vikings are not going to be easy to conquer. The scream alone pretty much preceded their fame and preceded their anger and their desire to win and overcome. And that scared the, um, a, uh, the Romans who were trained soldiers. They understood that there was a power behind a scream, behind a sound. Uh, and, and you got to understand that. Now, I was raised in the world. I wasn't raised in, the, in, in church. And look, by looking at some of you, you look pretty rough. doesn't look like you were raised in church either. And, um, but I tell you one thing. Uh, I know what that means because in Italy, especially in the island of Sicily where I was born and raised, a sound means a lot to us. And so if somebody makes a sound of some kind, you know you can be dead, wounded, maybe hurt. It depends. The level of its sound or the rhythm of its sound really defines how bad you're going to be beaten. <laughs> but the, the truth is, it, it, this is true also, and I can go over and over the word of God. I can tell you a story where the Israelites were camping, unaware of the fact that the enemy was just watching them on the hills, ready to, go, to attack and ready to conquer them. The Israelites were totally unaware of the fact that there were enemies watching over them, about to conquer them and destroy them. Now watch this. And the Bible says that all of a sudden, as the Philistines were about ready to attack, a sound was heard in the camp. A sound was heard in the village, and, and the commander-in-chief said, what is this sound about? And, um, and the Bible says that he was told that, uh, that the Ark of the Covenant had just arrived in their midst, and that the sound was a sound of rejoicing because their God was in their midst. Now, I want to tell you, if you keep reading the story, they never attacked, they never won the battle, and they deflected from, from doing it. What I'm telling you is this. Sometimes you don't know what kind of devils are after you. You never know what kind of things could happen to you during your day. But if you can just open up your mouth and take a moment to say, praise God, I love you, Lord. Whatever you want to worship God about, I want to tell you, it will be heard at the gates of hell, and hell may just re refrain from attacking you because hell knows that boy is not dead, that girl has not lost it, and that couple, that family is still on track, and you don't want to mess with somebody who is in covenant with God. What I'm trying to tell you, sometimes a sound of praise, it's never out of place. It's always in line with the word of God, and it's a, a terrorizing sound that the devil hates. So don't ever be intimidated about opening up your mouth and let them know, I'm not dead, I'm not dead, I'm not dead, I'm here. Every word you speak, you tell the devil, I'm still here. I'm wounded, but I'm still here. I'm, I'm broken, but I'm still here. I'm bent, but I'm still here. I'm, I'm bleeding, but I'm still here. I'm confused, but make no mistake, I still have a hallelujah inside of me. And whatever I say is going to be used against you. You don't want to mess with me. Sometimes you just have to learn, even in, in hard days, when you don't have a strength, the strength to say anything, when you don't have a, the will to say. Have you ever been there behind a, the wheel driving? And the last thing you want to say is a hallelujah. 
Okay, I'm talking to me because you don't want to be, be identified as such. But I want to tell I'm one of those guys sometimes gets behind the wheel and I'm just, oh, God. But sometimes it's, it's just, you just have to speak a word to let the devil hear it, to make sure the devil hear me well. I still have a, a praise in my, in my soul. Don't make me, I know I'm confused. I know, I'm t- I know my wife really made me mad today. And I know I really, I, my, my pastor drove me crazy. But, but I'm going to tell her, I still have a praise in my soul. Don't, don't make, make no means. I'm not dead. I'm not dead. I'm half dead, but I'm still here. Come on now. You're going to have to help me out. Have you been around preachers or evangelists that come and they say, I can preach all by myself. I don't need your help. Don't believe him. Don't believe him. They're lying. They're lying. Because I like when people talk to me. See, I was pastoring in the South. You know, they, they preach to you. They preach with you and they preach you down. They preach you. They wear you out. They wear you out. I mean, I was in Florida. And you don't know this pastor I told you about. And he's got about 200 and something people. They're all multicultural people. They're all crazy people. They own drugs. I told the pastor, you, you put drugs in their drinks. There's no way this people. And they just preach you. They pull you out of you. And the more they preach you out, the more they preach you, the more they pull you, they push you, the more you, they pull stuff out of you. And, and they don't want to go home. We were, we were I supposed to do a one-week revival. We end up there six weeks. I told the pastor, I'm leaving. I'm out of You're killing me, man. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to share with you a story as I get to my word, to the word of the Lord very quickly that I heard years ago. And, um, and this story is a true story. I didn't know it was a true story until somebody told me that a man and a, and a, and a, and a son were, were sharing a common interest in collecting rare works of art. This happened back in the 60s. And they, have an, they had an a, a avid uh, desire to, to collect as much as they could. They love paintings, they love art in general, sculptures, all kind of stuff. But they love art, and, um, and they travel, and they collected a lot of pieces, and they put them in a chamber that they had at home. And he was also object of visits um, from, from friends and people who would want to admire their collection. Well, the story tells us that the, the young man, the young son, died in a battlefield in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And uh, I don't have to tell you, surely that was the only son apparently in the story. And he was notified that the son was dead. And you can imagine that the grieving spirit of a father who hears that the only son that he loves so much is dead. He was a brave soldier, but he died in the Vietnam War. And he was notified and the story tells us that he sheltered himself behind walls and didn't want to see anybody, didn't want to talk to anybody, didn't want to share. You know, you understand. And so the story tells us that he, was, um, he lived in isolation for quite a, some time. And then at one point in December during Christmas time, a man, a young man knocked on his door. And he was an, a, a, a young man that he didn't know. And he said, sir, I have a package that I know your son would have loved for you to have. And he said, well, uh, said I, uh, who are you? And he said, I'm, a, I'm one of the soldiers for whom your son died, actually. And, and I was in uh, with him prior to the battle and uh, a day or two earlier. And I am not a painter, but I know your love for painting. And, and I draw him, uh, I draw himself on, on, this, on this canvas. And I, I know he wants you to have this. And so he said, come on in. And he opened the package and he was a portrait of his boy. And he was so taken by this drawing because it was done just two days or so before he went into this battle and then he died and the father just just began to cry and said son I don't know I don't know what you're going to ask for this but whatever money whatever amount you ask me I'll pay and the young man said well I said I didn't come to sell I want to give it to you and so he gave him the uh, this portrait and the son took him in and he, then he took it and he put it on on the entrance of his chamber where he kept the rest of the artifacts and paintings very costly paintings and the story tells that when people would come to visit and and see and his collection he would first stop at his son's picture and he said let me let me and he would say let me talk to you about my son and he will tell me about how brave he had been and how much he knew about art and how much they had trouble. And then he will take him along and watch and show the rest. Well, the story goes that the father died. He was gone. And now there was going to be an auction of all his existing estate. 
and there was a, um, a close numbers of people that were called in for this occasion, probably a small chamber, and the auctioneer was, in, was uh, asked to um, uh, sell the estate. And so they came and gathered together, and uh, now the auctioneer stand behind the desk just like I, I am and addressed the, uh, the people and said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. We will now sell the first piece of this great collection. And he pulled out the painting of his boy and he placed it on the platform. And then he simply said, now, ladies and gentlemen, the openings, the bidding is open. And I wonder if anybody will start with $20. Well, you can imagine they didn't come for this worthless piece of art. That's not what their value was uh, uh, established upon. And, and, and they were kind of little, you know, unsettled and, and, and nobody bid it and for the occasion and, and, the, and the auctioneer uh, didn't seem to desist and he keep readdressing the crowd and says, ladies and gentlemen, we got this piece now. I wonder if anybody will give $20. Well, nobody said anything. Nobody did anything. Nobody ever raised their hands. But one man stood in the very back and raised his hands and said, I will... Take it if you let me have it for $20. And we don't know who the man was. Apparently somebody says he was a gardener. Somebody says he was a good friend. We don't know. That's where the story goes a little funny. But we don't know. But somebody offered $20. The auctioneer said we got $20. Anybody else would bid that. You know, to say, people were just almost upset. Give it to him. Let's move on. And so... He pounded his gavel, going once, going twice, sold for $20. And the story tells us that the auction was, or the painting actually went to this man for $20. And everybody gets excited until something really strange is happening. And the auctioneer closes his book and readdresses the people and simply says, thank you for coming. The auction is now over. And that's what everybody really got upset. And somebody stood and said, sir, you owe us an explanation. We haven't even started. You're shutting this thing down. This worthless piece of art was just a purchase, and that's it. That's it. And he said, sir, I was not allowed to say anything until you would ask this question. And uh, he said he pulled a piece of paper out of his book, and he said, this is really the will of the Father. And he said, only the painting of his son will be auctioned off. And whoever gets the son will get everything. Will get everything. Whoever got the son will inherit the whole estate. This is a true story. And I, I remember my secretary giving me this when I was pastoring. He said, I want you to read this. You will love it. Never forgot. Never forgot, Pastor Belfman. And I want to tell you, as I begin to correlate or, or create a parallel with the spiritual world, world, I begin to understand now more than ever that everything that Jesus said, Everything that the master spoke about, whether he was referring to water, fire, sun, bread, no matter what he was referring back to, I want you to know that every behind every natural word or event that he spoke about or described about, there's always a spiritual implication. Always. Always. Because you see, you got to understand something about the God that we serve. He, he has to speak to us and he is going to have to make himself understood to you because we have finite minds, meaning we can only perceive so much, especially with our five senses. Beyond that, we're lost. That's where faith comes along. But I want to tell you that anytime Jesus speaks, he understands that in order for you to understand the spiritual world, he has to help you understand your own world and said that's why why he speaks of water and he speaks of, of fire and it relates to bread and he speaks of common things that we, you are acquainted with, that you are naturally uh, connected with to then give you a spiritual implication. If we're going to make it to Sunday and, and if that what's, that, that's what the Lord is going to uh, continue to make me feel, you, you're you going to see how water was really more than just drinking water that Jesus was speaking about and you will, you will see what God really meant when he 
spoke of that. But I want to tell you today that as I begin to read the story and I begin to think about the terms, I begin to think about the subject, I begin to relate to what Jesus was trying to tell everybody when he said, if you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, then everything else shall be headed unto you. You see, this is the problem with the church today. We have, we have placed value to things that really don't matter. We have, we have uh, um, lost our, our, our ability to prioritize our life in, in the right way. And so we, we are placing values, uh, value on things that really are temporary and they really don't matter for the kingdom of God. Because everybody wanted those priceless pieces of art, but nobody wanted the son who was uh, worthless to the eyes of the beholder. I want to tell you today that when Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, even though nobody likes it and nobody wants it and nobody feels good about it and nobody, everybody has something to say about it. If you seek ye first what nobody wants, I give you everything everybody's seeking after. What Jesus is trying to teach us is this. You got to put your priority back in place. I wonder what would happen if we can reprioritize our life and begin to understand that the things that we put on our first place are not necessary what God wants us to put in the first place. I wonder what would happen if we begin to understand that the things that are really valuable only belong to the kingdom of God and everything else is only temporary baby. If you live long enough and I'm sure you have, you some of you know that life really is worthless without the kingdom. It's just nothing. It's just a fading. It's just a, it's just a, you know you're just dying creature going to the same place where everybody's going. And I want to tell you, you're going to have to think straight about the things of God and put your life back in order. Because I want to tell you, Jesus said something right. He said, if you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, if you seek me first, if you try to seek me above and beyond everything that you're trying to run after, no, no, that will bless you. But he said, I shall add things unto you. He didn't say you have to beg it. You didn't say you have to beg me for this. He didn't say you're going to have to plead about this. He said I will add it unto you. In a few words, I'll give it to you as you need it. You don't even have to pray about it. I want to tell, I don't know how you feel about it, but from time to time, I have to stop for a moment and pause my life and understand, hey, I need to put everything back in order because I've got God on the third place when I should have him in the first place. When I get up in the morning, I don't need to read my Twitter. I don't need to get on my Facebook. The first thing I got to do when I get up in the morning, I got to open up my mouth and kneel before God and say, Lord, I want to thank you for just another day you're giving me. You got to put things back where they belong. You see, that's what happens. We, we, we schedule everything around the church. When the church really should be scheduled around everything. We should place the church as an important thing. Because this is who we are. That's what we are. We are not in church just to be, you know, this is not just a social event. This is not just a, well, I need to soothe my conscience. I need to just feel my emptiness. This is more than this, babe. This is more than just, you know, and, and I'm telling you, we're losing track of these things. We're, we're kind of deep deviating from these things. And Jesus was so right. You've got to keep seeking me. You've got to put me first. Make sure that your career, be, be a career-minded person. I don't have a problem with that. Be an, an, If you love education, be educated. Do whatever you got to do, but don't ever place God on the third or second level of your priority. Don't put God on the back, on the back side of the hill. Don't, don't put God in the attic of your, of, your, of your mind and say, well, I, I, I'll see you later. I want to tell, we got to go back to the, our, the what we're really matters the most. You know, I want to tell you something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just telling what I feel. But there, there, there was some, I remember, and I'm not that old. I mean, I, 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 I'm old, but I'm not that old. 
But I want to tell you, it's, I remember Pastor Belfman when we were rushing to the church and, and, and sit in the first rows for hours before hours before the service will start. We were so eager to be there and hear the word and get excited. And it was not just the newness of it. We were just on fire for God I, because there were so little world-minded people in us. And until all of a sudden the world took over and all of a sudden now we're coming late. We don't come at all. We sit in the back row. We don't praise anymore. I've been in church 32 years. I still have to praise him. I don't have the right to shut up and do nothing. I have no arrived. You know what I'm trying to say? I want to try to say, don't let the devil mess you up and keep your mouth shut and don't let the devil mess you up that you've been in church a long time and you don't have to do anything. I still teach Bible study. And you know what? When I first started my Bible study, I was, Pastor both of my, I couldn't even speak English. I couldn't even speak Italian, much less English. And, and I said, Lord, I'm going to do it anyway because the devil is a liar. And I want 20 people in one year, baptized in Jesus' name and got the Holy Ghost. And you could understand that thing I said. But they felt the spirit of love because I love people until they drive me nuts. But I love them. But that's why the Lord delivered me from pastoring. And I've been 13 years on the road. I love it. So I do all this damage and I leave and he's going to say, well, I'm sorry about Pat. <laughs> I'm sorry about Pilot Platani. He had a, he was, he was really. You know, I like Mary. I like Mary. I like Mary. Because Mary is uh, a woman or a young girl, actually, who did not understand a lot about God and that particular event, but nevertheless uh, submitted herself to the word of the Lord. Sometimes we don't have a, a confirmation of what we feel or what the Lord speaks about. Sometimes all we have is a word. A word. Is the word of God enough for us? Or do we have to have an angelic presentation? Gabriel showing up. <laughs> Here I am. And, and we're becoming, oh, I don't have the time. You see, I don't have the time really to expound on all these thoughts. But I, th th this is a dangerous generation. This young generation is dangerous. Armed and dangerous. Because this is what I, I feel sorry for them. Because I do have the same problem, but I'm, I'm a little over it. Because this is what happens. You see, Mary had a little hard time trying to figure out what was going on. And, and there was a different case. But this generation here is even more in danger, Pastor Belfman, because we have become a generation that has developed and used the five senses in an enormous way. Do you understand that everything that you do nowadays, it's about touching? Touch screen. You gotta touch. How many, how many years has it been since you haven't written anything? Have you tried to write lately? I try to write lately. I look like an Egyptian using Egyptian writings. My wife said, What is this? I'm trying to write. Because we haven't written, we don't write anymore. We text. We use our senses. So we are hearing all the time. Earbuds in our ears. I have to yell at my kid. Hey! I'm trying to talk to you. What did you say, Dad? Anybody? Okay, your father a little intimidated by your kids. You don't say anything. Okay. But, but, the, but we touch and, and we hear. And we're very visual. You know what this is doing? It's developing our senses in a way that has never been developed before. Now you say, what is this all to do with God? Because the more you develop your senses, your natural senses, the, the more you have the ability to murder your faith. Because faith's enemy, the greatest faith's enemy you can ever find is facts. The more facts you know, know the, more, the less faith you have. That's why you have to become like a child. The less you know, the better it is. The more you know about facts and things, the more the doctor tells you about stuff, that you're not going to make it. We check this. The more you don't can believe, your faith weakens. That's why Jesus said you got to be like a little baby. A little baby, you can tell, jump. Everything is going to be all right. He'll jump. So this faith-like child that we need, it, it helps us to, to increase the, the value or the volume of our faith. And so we can operate in faith. But when we are developing our senses and we need to touch in order to survive. Have you ever tried to take the iPhone away from your kids for a day? They become demon-possessed. Dad, I don't know if I can make it. I need a doctor. Oh, you're not talking to me. It's all right. 
times. I know that anyway. You don't have to tell me. I mean, ourselves so hooked on these things. And because we're so touching, because we are so sensitive to the earring and, and we are so uh, sensitive to, to the visual, then trying to get a young man or a young lady in a room, in a dark room, turn the light off, lock yourself in, and ask them, pray for an hour. How are you going to do that? <coughs> We can even drive without texting. We can even drive without talking to somebody on the phone. And this is what's really hurting us. I'm telling you, we need to pre- put priorities back where they belong. I'm telling you. I'm telling you what I know is becoming dangerous. I want to I wanna keep seeking the kingdom of heaven so all things will be added unto me. I, wanna, I know Mary doesn't understand. I know Mary has a difficult time, but I want to tell her I love her response because I'm telling you, this girl was, knew something about the spiritual that I, I learned from her because when she, the angel told her, baby, you're going to get pregnant. And you're going to have a baby. And the baby is going to change the course of history. You understand that? And she said, I don't understand that. Because naturally, in this world, I need a man for me to get pregnant. I can't do this on my own. There is no way I can do this. See, she was reasoning with the, with the natural while God was trying to explain that supernatural. And she was locked up in her little world until you understand. In fact, I don't have the time to tell you. She said, I have no man to help me out. If you read on in the Bible, you, you meet a lot of people that says, I have no man. I have no man. Pull up Bethesda. Remember, Jesus showed up, the creator of everything, and said, hey, man, what do you would like for me to do today? I have no man. I didn't say that. I didn't ask if you have a man or not. I asked, what do you want me to do for you? But we are so locked up in this man-depending stuff and man-depending. We are dependent upon mankind, dependent upon the favor of people. And we are dependent upon what people can do then that we don't... We don't, we don't what, ignite the supernatural. I want to tell you, I want to tell you one thing. We don't need a man. We don't need humanity. We don't need somebody from this world to help us out having revival. Now, I know you, 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 you might not believe this, but I want to tell you, God doesn't need somebody's money. God doesn't need somebody's uh, favor. I mean, we don't need it, but from God, I want to tell you, we got we to gotta get rid of this carnal mentality that without man, you know, we can have a larger church. Without a man, we can have revival. Without a man, without a man, without this, without that, without a man. Oh, come on, let's, let's ignite the supernatural. I want to test God on his word. He spoke it, he said it. I want to try him. <clears throat> And I have. And so Mary, stay with me. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. And so Mary is, is, is confused because um, she's battling the natural with the supernatural. She's battling this, this potential, possible event. How many times have we ruined God's promises because we were so carnal we couldn't receive it, we couldn't believe it? Because when you talk about faith, you're talking about something that looks foolish, <coughs> something that looks crazy. Listen, faith will never make sense to you. Never. It will always be in contradiction with your senses, with your reason, all the time. All the time. But I want to tell I'd rather get out of my boat and take two steps on the water with my faith and drown the rest of the way because of my human carnal perception than stick around in the boat and do nothing about it. Because I'll tell you one thing. I've been in church 32 years, and I want to see God do some crazy stuff. I've seen just about a little bit of everything, but I want to see God doing the crazy stuff that I really love to see God doing. And I'm not going to let this human flesh, I'm telling you, I have decided, Pastor, I'm going to get more radical than I've ever been. You can ask around. I've been really radical. I pull people out of the chair. There are no visitors, thank God for you. You, you. I pull them out of the chair. I pray them through right there where they are. I, I, I cannot be ordinary all the time. I cannot try. I cannot just let my flesh dictate how I should operate in the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Ghost that said, go find me that woman. Go find me that boy. See, see, I lost some of you. <laughs> well, if you don't believe me, do this. Go to Little Rock, Arkansas. 
They're running about 2,200 people by the cities of my revival. And hear me saying that the Lord told me to find me a woman who tried to commit suicide yesterday. Now, if this was the only group of people that God had asked me to find, I will give it a shot. Maybe it was her. I may be missing it. My baby. But it's a small crowd. But 2,200 people. You cannot try to guess. <clears throat> it's on CD. I never heard it. Never listened, but they record everything. And you do a crazy thing, you find the woman, she cries, she weeps, says, I'm the woman. You tell somebody, write down, within 14 days after the battle is over, you're going to get your miracle. And there are hundreds of people standing 14 days later saying, things that I've prayed for years are happening. Now you say, Brother Frank, are you special? No, I'm testing God's word. You have to speak God's word. And if you believe it enough, heaven will back you up. Even if God, uh, you see, there's some things even in the Bible that we don't have proof that this preacher spoke about that were backed up or were spoken by God to him. But he spoke in any way because he wanted to defend the kingdom. And God watched him and said, I can't believe the boy believes me. Back him up. Back him up. He said, shut up the heavens for three and a half years. Shut it up. That's the way faith works. Faith is money. Faith is the only tool of exchange with heaven. You want to do business with heaven? You give him faith and they'll give you the goods. It doesn't work by saying, oh, you know, it doesn't work. In that. That's what Jesus said. The only thing that Jesus cannot do that is impossible, what is it? Without faith, it is impossible to please him. The only currency you can have, can use in order to do business with God is I give you my faith and you give me in return what I believe. And sometimes you fail, sometimes it's half, sometimes it's whole. Uh, anyway, anyway, I'll, I'll talk to you later, maybe next year. <laughs> so Mary is trying to figure out what is this supernatural event in the natural you know, atmosphere here. How, and, and I like what she said. Oh, now I'm going to pass her for two and a half seconds. Are you ready for this? You, you like me up to this point. Now you're not going to like me. <laughs> she said, how is this possible, pastor? How is this possible? How is this going to happen? You see, she didn't say, why? Why me? I'm about to get married, baby. Joseph, he's a good-looking man. And I'm about to get married. Everybody loves me in town. Now I got this baby out of wedlock. Everybody's going to gossip about me. He's going to go nuts and leave me. She could have said, why me? Isn't it true that sometimes we come to a place in our lives where we say, God, do something to help me. Do something to fix me. Do something to really put my life back in order. Give me the miracles. And all of a sudden God says, all right, let's start cutting some things off your life. And you say, oh, why? Am I talking to you? We say, why? Because the circle of friendship that you used to know before you were saved no longer fits you. And you got to get out. And maybe, maybe God says, you're going to have to start a new circle of friendship. Maybe you need to do this. Maybe you, and it's going to be painful because on everything that you're going to have to do, it's going it's to require some cutting, some severing, some decision, decision, decision. You know what decisions are? What's the root word? Incision. You have to make some cut. You got to cut some. And Mary could have said, I don't want this. You want to use me? You want to do something miraculous? But I don't want to be the tool. I don't want to be the vessel because it's going to mess up my natural life. That's why we don't get the miracle and the miraculous because the miracle is going to cost you something. People are going to talk bad about you. They're going to think you lost your mind until it happens. Until then, you are strange. Have you ever noticed you go to church? I, I travel a lot, so but I see a lot of people. I saw people worshiping and praising God, acting almost foolish, but they're really worshiping the Lord. And the rest of the church is there. And they're all judging her, uh, judging him. But the truth is, she's worshiped and you're not. 
She may look foolish to you, but God doesn't think that way. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and see, now, I like that because there are some people in church that have to adjust their thinking, their dynamic of thinking, their, their, set, their mind set has to change. Because sometimes you may start inquiring and arguing with whatever God has to, wants to do with you. And, and in, I pastor 17 years. I know what I'm saying. When, when you try to do something and the pa- people say, why? Why do we need a larger church? Isn't this cute? Why do we need to do this? And why did you ask that girl not to sing tonight? It's always a why. Why people worry me? And I didn't say white. I said why. W. <laughs> w H Y. Sometimes you do too. You, you, do, you, you concern me a little bit. But, but it's the why people. The W H Y people. Okay. They concern me because it's always a, always arguing, always always um, uh, compromising, always defined, always uh, arguing the pastor's judgment. Why? Why? Why do we need to buy buses to have bus ministry? Why do we need to do this? And why do we need to do that? And why? 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 I don't like why people. Why people? I like the how people. Because the how people, just like Mary, she didn't try to push everything away. She said, I really don't understand this, but can you tell me how? How are we going to win this city? How can we win and sit sinners in these seats? How are we going to do it? It's no why that worries me. I mean, it's not the why that that threatens me or or that scares me. I like people that always say, how? These are inquisitive people. They want to know, how is this going to happen? How are we going to do this? How can we, how can we facilitate revival? How can, how can we increase our level of worship? Whatever that may be. How, how, how? It's not why. Well, I need you to sing some play. Why? I need you to have a quiet. But why? But Mary said, how? And I love what the angel said. Here's the answer. The angel said, oh, um, Mary, um. Okay, how are we going to do this? Um, okay, Mary, uh, there's going to be an intergalactical uh, intervention coming from a place unknown to mankind. A sphere of glory showing and coming around. And he will perceive, he will be perceived as an unknown force, but the force will come inside of you. And that, that's not what he said. Because you cannot explain everything. Sometimes you just can't explain why the pastor feels driven towards certain things. Sometimes you can explain why some things are happening. You cannot reason everything that God's trying to do. So the angel who was smart said, um, this is the way you're going to understand it. The Holy Ghost will come upon you. And when he comes upon you, everything is going to be clear. You don't have to worry about it. Everything is going to be all right. Can I preach for two more minutes? I, 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 Sometimes I used to deal with, with people in my church. They were stubborn. They had issues. And they, and they, and they were cold. And, and they had, a, you know, dramas in their lives. And, and after a while, you get tired. And I want to tell you, the best way to deal with things like this, the best way to deal with issues and conflict, and, and coldness and, 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 and jealousy and all kinds of stuff is this. The Holy Ghost is going to get you, baby. And when the Holy Ghost is going to get you, everything is going to be all right. Sometimes all we need is a good dose of Holy Ghost speaking in tongues and everything is going to look better. I can't explain why all hell is breaking loose in your life. I don't know. <sighs> I don't know why certain things have to be done. I, can't, I don't have the answers for everything. In fact, I don't have any answer. And the truth is, all I know is this. If you just let the Holy Ghost define you, finish you up, if you let the Holy Ghost hit you, by the time you're through this, this service tonight, you're going to go home with some more quick answers in your mind. You're going to say, well, I was at the altar. I was spoke, speaking in tongues, and I felt the Holy Ghost just whispering a little word in my ears, and he said, everything is going to be all right, and next time you see your husband, just hit him and hit him hard (laughs) just joking do you understand what I'm trying to tell you you cannot push away the miraculous try to reason everything if God said you're going to have a baby without a man thank God who needs a man anyway 
We used to be useful. I don't know what we're here for. Ladies make more money than us. They're not karate, kung fu. They defend themselves. They got the best job. They are so, you know the most CEOs are women. Did you know that? You didn't. They make less money because the man still rules. But they're taking our jobs, you know. Oh, I wish I could give you a marriage seminar right now. I'll save you a lot of. We'll save that for later. Ah, no, just give me, let me give you one. Let, let me just give. I just like, I like this. I will, especially when my wife is not around, I love this. Let me just give a little hint. This is one thing you're going to save your marriage. First of all, you've got to understand the man you're dealing with and the woman. Because it is the thing. Man was created at the image of God. Not a woman. The man. Okay? Stay with me. So we reflect God's nature. Now the woman was pulled out of man. In fact, the word form related to a woman in the original Hebrew, the word is the word built. The one was built out of man's body. Built. Now, the first thing, the first revelation is right here. Everything that gets built is going to need maintenance. Oh, let me talk to you. I, th- I don't think they got it. Meaning your wife is going to require attention. I just saved half of your marriage life struggle and frustration. They demand attention because a woman was built and everything gets built and it's maintenance continually, continual. That's why when your wife asks you, how was your day? You say, good. But when you ask your wife, how was your day? She starts at seven and by eight o'clock or so, she's about done telling you how her day went. So you have learned like me not to ever ask. Okay, let me talk to this. You're just nervous up in here. See, with a man instead, he reflects gut nature. And that's why I was referring a moment ago, the roles have changed because a man, think about this, a man is like God, reflection, character, meaning that we are essentially protectors. We are providers and we are performers. Any man in here understand what I'm saying? Protectors, you, you, you try to, t- somebody touches your wife, you might be skinny and 20 pounds. Somebody messes with your wife or your kids, Goliath comes out of you. You're a provider. It's important for our, us men to bring a check back home. Providing is what makes us fulfill or fulfill us. That's why if you were reading in 2008 what happened during the economic crash, a lot of men were killing themselves because they couldn't provide. And some of them were not accidental. They did it on purpose so their mom and dad could get a check. This is all history. This is all Time Magazine stuff. You have to understand the nature of man. The other thing is he's a performer. If he does not perform well, he loses his own identity and he feels, he feels below his self-esteem range. That's why when he performs better, he thinks that the wife loves him more. The wife will always love him. But men are created that way. That's why when you don't perform well in whatever area you're in, you don't perform well, you haven't done well, you don't feel good about yourself. You feel almost ashamed. You feel almost, and and then then if you've got a bad wife like Job's, then she's going to say, I should have married Philip when I was in high school. He really knew how to fix cars. I don't know how to fix cars. I got a PhD. That's all I know. Is that bad? Can Philip? Teach leadership organization. <laughs> this is the way you change the mind of a man. You do what you would do with God. You praise him. See, it's like a kid. If you get a kid and he doesn't perform well in school, you don't say, you're an idiot. <laughs> because if you tell him that, he'll live up to your expectation. But if you praise him... 
you will pray, if you can praise him right, he will hurt himself trying to live up to your praise just like a kid would do. If my wife says, I want you to paint my house uh, because I really need it, and she said, I know you can, baby, you are such a skilled man. I know you can, you can make, you know, straight stripe. I mean, you, I know you can, baby. I know, you, oh, your hair, I love your hair, by the way. And so, uh, and <laughs> this is what I do. I, I don't know how to paint that good. I just go to Google. Learn how. Next day, it's painted because she is praised. That's why God doesn't have one name. He has got multiple names. You need peace, poof, he becomes Jehovah Shalom. You need provision, poof, he becomes what? Whatever you praise him for. Provider and on and on and on and shelter, refuge. Whatever you need him, he becomes. Because your praises will change the state of your God. That's why we need praise in the house. That's why you need to learn how to press your husband into what you want him to become. Because if you criticize him, he'll hide in a cave and you'll never see him again. But if you can learn how to, because remember we work, that's why, that, oh I don't have the time, I don't have the time. I don't have time. You gotta, you gotta study a little history. Back in the forties, when the war broke out, that's when the woman be, became emancipated. That's what ruined our man. Because when our men were called to war, brother, you remember when we were called to war, they were called to war, and they went to war. What the women were left with the jobs that the men were doing. So they became mechanics. They became factory trainers. They had to do hard work, and they hadn't done it up to then. This is social study, and and so when men came back, the woman said, I. I can handle myself. I can do this. Sit down, shut up, and listen. Because what happened, she gained a position that she was not entitled to. She became the first in the line when she should have been second. As the Bible says, I'm not dictating this. The head of the church is Jesus. Next is man, there's woman, and on and on. So what happened, the roles were inverted and the woman came so strong to believe that she could take over the world. And now men who are providers, who are protectors, who are performers, they're lost and manhood is lost because they don't know what to do. You cannot protect a woman. You, ne you haven't traveled like I've traveled. Well, you open the door to a lady in the lane, look at you and don't you do that to me. I'm telling you the truth. You've never been to Canada, go to Canada. Try to open the door to a lady, they look at you. Who do you think I am, weaker than you? I can open the door by myself. You don't believe what I'm saying, travel. Travel to Europe, <laughs> you'll learn faster. And so me, women make more money. Women are more involved in working than, uh, than taking care of the kids or preparing a meal. And then this is, this is a story, social study. You know this. What I'm trying to tell you is this. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help your marriage. I'm trying to save you a couple hundred dollars with a counselor because it's going to kill you, man. It's going to kill you. I'm telling you, it's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. Okay. I'm just messed. I'm just, I'm just feeling you. I'm feeling you. See where you are. All right. What was I? I mean, I wish I, some men would raise their hands and say, hey, man, help me out of here because all the women are looking at me funny right now. Can any man raise their hands and say, I need some praise up in here. I need somebody to tell me I can do this. I work hard. And I'm going to work myself to death until I get it done. I'm by myself. I feel like Elvis Presley right now. Are you lonesome tonight? I am. I think about the both friends don't want backing me up right now. Okay, let's, 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 let's move. Let's move. It's getting dangerous soil here. Okay. Please stay with me. I'm almost done. I'm almost there. Okay. So Mary finally accepted. says, I don't understand everything, but be unto me as thy word speaketh. Just do it. Just whatever it is. And I love her, her availability. I love her openness. I love the fact that you don't have to understand everything about God. Just do it. Have faith. Have faith. Just do it. Just do it. Speak it. Try it. Hey, listen, we're all dying. At the age of eight, I'm, if I live to be eight, I'm going to say some things I never said in my life. I'm going to be dead anyway. Can you use that against me? I'm just going to pray for the blind man and say, just open up yours and see. If you can see, I kill you. Just some things like that. I'm just doing crazy things. <laughs> I'm just going to test God. I mean, I'm not going to do it now because otherwise my, I'm, I'm through evangelizing. But, but I'm going to do it when I'm old. I'm going to do some things when I'm old. When I'm retired, I'm going to do some crazy thing, Pastor. 
Everything I've been wanting to do since I was young, yeah, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for dead birds to come alive. I'm going to go to the cemetery, try to pray everybody through the Holy Ghost, come out of the tomb. I'm going to call Lazarus out of there. I do whatever. <laughs> just messing with you. Okay. So Mary, Mary is, is frustrated. And, uh, and finally, the Bible says that she accepted. But once she accepted that, when this baby was about to be born or was in the process of, of being formed, of course, everything went bad for her because the Bible says Joseph didn't like it. You know, how can you believe an explanation? I mean, you go home and your baby and your wife's got a belly. So, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't think better. An angel of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And, and so he, he, was, he was, she was frustrated because now that angel told her, you have been favored. Now, let me give a definition between being favored and being blessed. Here's the difference. Because I want this church to understand that you are not just another church listed in the yellow pages in the city. You are not just blessed. You're favored. This is the way it is. Okay, it's like when I was pastor, I went to see a friend of mine. He was, I was trying to win him to the Lord. He's a doctor. And I didn't tell him I was coming. And I walked into this office and there were people sitting waiting for their turn. It was a pretty busy house, you know, doctor's offices. They're all little people. I was about to take my seat and say nothing to him. And he just walked out of his room and he saw me. And he said, Franco, I said, yeah, come on in, come on in. So what would you have done? You would have said, oh, no, I'm going to be waiting two hours. It's all right. It's okay. I, I got my, it's all right. It's, I, I'll be blessed when I see. I'm, I'm going to wait for two hours here just struggling, dying, hearing all these people dying, talking about diseases. It's going to be all right. Gonna, no, this is what I did. I said, excuse me. I didn't look at anybody. I would advise not to look at anybody in the eye. Just keep walking. And I went to see him. He took me inside his office and he, and, he, and he talked to me for a little while. And then I told him what I want to do. You know, just general checkup. And he did. This is the difference between being blessed and being favored. You have to understand that you, see, if you pray God and you pray for healing and God gives it to you, you are blessed. If you pray God that you need a job and he gives it to you, you're blessed. But if you pray God, and you don't ask anything, and he gives it to you, you're favored. Okay, you missed it. Mary never prayed for this. Noah never prayed for anything like that. He didn't say, Noah, oh, I brought God. He said, Noah, you have found favor before the eyes of the Lord. What I'm trying to help you understand is this. You cannot live in this city and go to this church and act like a Christian thinking you're going to just be blessed because being blessed is not enough. I'm tired of being blessed. I want favor from God. I want God to open doors that I never asked him to open. I want a God to enlarge my coast without me ever praying because he favors me. He loves me. Heaven is watching on me. Anytime you walk in this city and you take a step, you got to understand this is my city. God has favored me. God is going to give me some souls. God is going to give me revival. I'm not just another church listing the yellow pages. I know everybody's going to be blessed. Let him be blessed. But I want to be favored when I go to the bank. I want the director to come out. I want the president of the bank who come out and say, I would like to talk to you, Pastor Buffman, because I know you want a, 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 a loan for your new church. Here it is. I want to tell you, we need to learn to think about people who are favored and not just blessed. Come on, you're going to have to elevate your thinking. Say, I'm a child of God. I'm not just another guy in a church somewhere. This is the church of the living God. The blood that falls in my vein is the blood of Jesus. I got a name. And his name. I want to tell you, 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 you got to elevate your thinking. That we're not just, we've got to be favored. I want to be faithful. When I go to church, when I, when I, when I was in, in, my, in my church in, in Dallas, Texas, I was favored. I was favored. I knew I was favored because I would be walking into the mayor's room. I would be walking into the council room. And, I, and you understand with my broken English, all my stuff but playing against me, here I am. And he's, he's, he's accommodating my issues. He's changing the rules just about. He said, okay, Pastor Planea, we'll, 
We'll do that. Don't, don't worry about it. If they wouldn't do that easy. But sometimes you have to walk into a room and just believe I got the favor of God. God is walking with me right now. And I'm going to try it out. I'm going to do it. I'm telling you. I'm telling you I've come to a place in my life, Pastor, that I'd rather take two steps all by myself on the water than stay in the boat for the rest of my life. I've been on the boat for 35 years. I'm tired of it. I want to get out and do some incredible stuff. And I'm telling you, I, 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 I don't say this everywhere I go, but you just follow me on my, on my Instagram stuff. There's some blow mining stuff I mean blow you away it's not that I do it I just practice just practice waves of revival halfway into preaching people standing crying come running to an altar favor favor speaking words that heaven backs you up I'm telling you if we're going to stay ordinary you're going to just be an ordinary church you're just going to be another our church waiting in line to see Jesus can I take you to the book called the Gospels? One of the books, I think it's in Mark. Yes, Mark chapter 10. Where everybody is standing in line to get to the door to see Jesus. But there were four men, only four, that said, ah, no, 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 not for me. I'm waiting. I don't have time to wait. I'm running out of time. I'm dying. I got to have a revival. I got to see some soul being saved. If I cannot go on a straight line and wait, I'm just going to go around it climb mountains, climb walls, break roofs. I do whatever I got to do. And the Bible says this boy was saved because of your faith. Because the boy couldn't have it all by himself. He was too weak to have it. He was too sinner. But I'm telling four men changed the course of history. I want to tell you, I need some men and some women in this house to understand we are not an ordinary church. I want to be favored of the Lord and I don't want to just be blessed. Okay, I'm going to make one point. I, I, I got to finish. I, I deter too much. My kid, my boy hates me. I'm not his favorite preacher. I said, why one time? I said, baby. He said, daddy, it's because you go all over. You go all over the place. But I said, but then at the end I take you there, right? He said, yeah, but it's a long way. <laughs> it takes a long time. <laughs> <laughs> he hates me. <laughs> Before I come to my conclusion, and I, I, I try to explain to you why Mary was not, after all, cursed. Sometimes what seems to be a, 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 maybe an obstacle turns to be actually a weapon in your hands. Because everything the devil is going to use against you, you can use it against him. I told the devil one time, everything you taught me, everything you taught me, you taught me well, and I'm going to use it against you. You say, what are you saying, Brother Platon? That's what you should tell your enemy. Thank you for teaching him how to be aggressive in seeking after drugs. Thank you for giving me that drive to do bad things. You gave me a will. You gave me a strong determination. Now that I live for God, I'm going to take the same power that you empowered me and use it against you. Because I'm going to be mean. I'm going to be aggressive. I'm going to be just determined. That's what you're going to tell the devil. Everything you use. You know, there are people. You look like angels right here. But I wish I could take it to a room all by ourselves, just talking about the worldly stuff that we used to do. You know how they used to call me? They used to call me John Travolta. You know why? Because I went to watch the movie Saturday Night Fever, I think 20 times. I had every move down, baby. <laughs> every one of them. When I got saved, I didn't quit dancing. I just changed partner. Some of you look like, I don't know how to dance in the Lord. I yeah, yeah, come on now. Come on, John Travolta. You know, you know how to dance. You know how to get a, have a good time. You know how to make the moves. When people get dead in church, I don't know what the problem is. You were, you know, fisting and, and you were partying in the world. Let's do it for Jesus. Tell the devil everything you taught me. You know those few steps you taught me? But I'm going to use it against you. I'm going to make you so mad when I open up my mouth. Instead of screaming for help and screaming for drugs and screaming for alcohol, I tell what I'm going to scream about. I'm going to scream about Jesus because I love him and I can't. And nobody cared for me like he did. I want to tell you, you got the right to give God some praise. Oh, Jesus. Woo. Here it is, and I'm going to close. I'm just talking to you tonight. Have you ever wondered why 
Jesus had to come in the flesh. Now we are preparing for Pentecost. When I teach Bible studies, this is what I tell the people. We're trying to understand why do we need people to be filled with the Holy Ghost? What is this big deal? You know that I had a pastor, one of our guys, I'm, I'm not going to say names, i never say names. One of our guys who believes what I believe, they told me we make a big deal about the Holy Ghost. I said, you may be right. Maybe we emphasize too much and don't emphasize repentance as we should because I believe that if we are to follow the tabernacle plan, the first thing we should be doing in every service is repent. First thing, in order. Because you cannot make people worship when they're bringing sin in the house. That's why the first thing you had to do before you approach the most holy place, you had to kill something. You have to kill yourself, spiritually speaking. You have to kill some sin. Then the pastor doesn't have to struggle for 30, 40 minutes trying to get you to worship because you've been cleansed. You don't have any guilt. You can, but by the time the preachers preach, he has to wait 45 minutes for you to get hit. And finally, some of you will come and maybe repent and finally will get what they want. But if we were to do it at the beginning, I think our service will be way better. Because I tell you, I've watched some funny stuff in life. Because I remember, I'm evangelizing. I saw in Louisiana, I'll forget, I'm a little late coming to church. So I'm, I'm, I'm just par, I'm still in the car 10 minutes after the service. And there's a car coming. And parking is a couple in the church, and I see them fighting in the car. I mean, fighting, baby. You've never been in a fight until you pastor in the South. Am I right? Am I telling the truth? You don't know nothing about fighting, baby. I'm talking about big time. You're talking about they, they praise with you on Sunday, and they cut your tires on Monday. Slice them. I mean, make. So they're fighting. So I go to service. We have service, power, good stuff. All right, everybody's great. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. You know, I'm going. I'm going to the room, change my clothes like I always do. And I just noticed that these two very people are walking out of the church just as they came in, fighting the were, fighting they were still fighting. They just pick it up where they left. That's why... <laughs> That's why, that's why sometimes you just have to come to the house and give people 10 minutes to repent, make it right. So you can get rid of this hatred and get rid of this jealousy. You know, you've been eight hours under a boss that his, like I did when I was working in the secular world who has cussed and fussed and, and you're mad and you have this word just resounding in your brain. You need a little time to clean yourself. You know what I'm saying? I'm telling you, I don't think we do it right. I know we are following traditions. We shouldn't. And, and but the truth is, I give, you, give the people 10 minutes. You just need some repent. No, no words. Just repent. Because I'm telling you, you all, we all going to have something to repent about. Because something today happened, a thought or something. And so you come to church, you feel guilty. So you don't raise your hands. You don't feel right. You don't feel like you've done it. So it takes you time. You know what I'm saying? Okay, all right. Let, let's move on. i got to finish this. And so here it is. Why do you think Jesus came in the flesh? There is a reason why. That's what people need to understand about the Holy Ghost. Stay with me. I'm done. I know you're getting tired. Let, 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 give me a second. Now, uh, one thing I want to tell I don't have enough time to tell you all these things, but one thing you need to understand about the God that you're serving today is this. You have to know him from the beginning. I'm telling you what I, God has given me as a revelation for me. If I want to understand Jesus in the Old Testament, I have to go back to the book of Genesis and study this God. Because everything that he did and said reflects the nature of Jesus who you're going to have to deal with for the rest of your Christian life. That's why people grow frustrated, uh, Pastor Bothman. The reason why you grow frustrated about God is because he does things that you don't understand. And so you get frustrated and you backslide. If, but see, this is the thing. If you have a dysfunctional issue, if you have a, even a kid or yourself, you have a dysfunction in your life. Um, maybe there's torture in you, and you see a psychiatrist, and you get a session with him. The first thing that the, the doctor is going to ask you, the very first thing is going to ask you this. I want you to tell me more about your childhood. Have you ever wondered why? Because this is what you got to understand. If you want to know a person at 50, you got to know him how he was like at five. That's why some of us need to zip their mouth because it's easy to judge somebody you never knew at five. 
Because the girl that looks so, so defensive, the girl that looks like it's got a very aggressive character, maybe a 50, a 5, maybe she was violated. So maybe you need to zip it and quit judging people. Because I don't want to be judged, so I quit judging others. I don't care. You know, things happen. And, you know, people judge so easily. I don't know why people judge so easily. I don't have a heart. I don't have time to judge people. Because if you only knew some of my stuff, you would be walking out of this place. I'm just kidding. I don't kill anybody. But what I'm saying is, is we all have our weaknesses and we all have our affairs and we all have our issues. And it's so easy for us to just target somebody. One, that's why Jesus was so good to say, well, pick up the first stone and kill somebody. Can you do that? No, nobody could do it. So quit judging because you never know what they are at 50 if you never knew them, how they were at five. That's the thing with Jesus. People don't know this God in Genesis and they are frustrated. We are frustrated with Jesus in the New Testament. They, they, they backslide because when Jesus takes things away from you, you don't understand the process. When Jesus does everything slowly, you don't understand the progressive sequential order of the book of Genesis. Why do you think it took God seven days to build the world? Why don't you think God could have just stood on the balcony of the universe and simply say, let everything be? He could have done it one day, one word. Why did it take him seven days? Because if you understand, the, and there's just one thing you understand about God in the book of Genesis. If you understand his progressive sequential order, you will never grow so frustrated when things happen to you in the same process. You will understand why Joseph made it and some of you would have never made it. Because when somebody speaks evil of you, you will fight back. But Joseph didn't. Because Joseph was a sequential, progressive work of God. That's the way he deals with humanity because we creatures are sequential creatures. You do everything in sequence. You get up out of the bed in a certain side, what side, then you put your shoes on, you go to the rest. Same, it's sequential. Everything is sequentially done, progressively done. You don't jump into the shower with all your clothes on. It's sequential and progressive. And God wants to understand this order because when you see Joseph's life, how it happened progressively, you understand that God will never put animals on a planet unless there's oxygen first. That's why churches cannot have revival. Boom, 20, 200 people revival in a church because the church has to first have oxygen, has to have an atmosphere, has to create an environment that is conducive for growth and sustainment. Because if you put it 200 souls revival in a church, there's no teaching Bible study, no winning soul, they're all going to die. There's no oxygen in here. You understand what I'm saying? And this is part of life, not just corporate speaking, but it's also personally speaking. It's, it's the person that has to understand God is doing a progressive sequential work with me. I have to wait the end of the work to look back, understand everything he did and say, no, that was good. Because that's why the prophet could say, it was good that I was afflicted. How can you say that? You can, you're going to have to just wait the seventh day when you look back and say, now I know why the first day happened. Now I know why the second day happened. Now I know why I got in the pit. Now I know why I got beaten. Now I know why my brother sold me out to Egypt. Now I understand why I ended up in jail. Now I understand why I'm reigning on one of the most powerful country in the world. I wish you could listen to what I have to say. Because I'm telling you, if you get to know this God of Genesis, you will never, never be frustrated again. I'm telling you what I know. If I, if I had time, I'll take you two hours just to tell you everything about God. Started from the first words, the character of God, the energy and the sequence. That's one thing. And then the, the, character, the character of God, what God was trying to tell when he said he moved upon the face of the earth. And then I will tell you why he spoke everything into existence. Because the moving of the God, of, of, of God and the spirit of God combined with the word together brings a creational work that is important for revival because this is what happens if the spirit and the word don't work together fuse harmoniously together you will never have a creational work that's why every time you read in the word of God there was the wind blowing there was the spirit moving there's always the words being spoken 
at all times. The Bible says that Ezekiel stood on the cliff of this valley and so what? Dread, dead, dry bones. And he said, and God said, I want you to speak the word. Speak the word. Speak the word. And he spoke words. And the word of God, which is nothing but a creative power, put everything back in order where there was chaos, just like in Genesis. Scattered, dead, dry bones. No order, no sequence. And all of a, God, all of a sudden, he speaks the word and these bones <laughs> assemble back together because that's what the word does. The word brings order into your life. That's why sinners love the word because all of a sudden they want to do right. All of a sudden they want to live for God. It's bringing order into chaos just like in the beginning. But then it was not as sufficient because as you remember, the dead dry bones were still assembled but they were still and lifeless. And so God said, now we need the move of the Holy Ghost upon these. We need the move upon them. Speak to the wind. The wind is always related to the spirit comes along and all of a sudden everything that was dead begins to live again. The word cannot do it all by itself and the spirit cannot do it by itself. You need a combination of word and spirit. That's why it's not enough to hear the preacher preach on Sunday. You need to have a move of the Holy Ghost or there will never be creational power and everything will stay dead. wait for the preacher to stir you up. You just got to move and create that energy that brings life to what there's not. Oh, God. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just got two days. I got to leave. I'm trying to give a little more. I want you to fall in love with this God because some of us have lost our first love. Because you're frustrated about this God. You don't know what he's doing. You don't know why you're single. You don't know, you don't know why you're married. <laughs> you know why the car broke down. You don't know what this happened. You don't know what's going on. Why you lost your job. And we frustrate ourselves. We just quit on God. Quit on God. I thought God loved me. He loved, of course he loved. Listen, baby. If God wanted to finish you up, he would have done a long time ago when you were a sinner. You would have been dead. So what should he do now that he, that he saved you? Oh, so he's, he's little, he's got some patholog pathologies, I'm, I mean some problems because I, I'm going to save you. I'm going to rescue you from, from this lifestyle. I'm going to rescue you from this thing that are going to kill you. And I'm going to finish you up. <laughs> but you're going to have to learn how to say, oh, it was good when I was afflicted. You ought to call your enemies and tell, thank you so much for hitting me and making my life miserable. I feel better. <laughs> oh, I don't have the time to take you there. How the enemies really can make, your, can make your future, can really truly. It's all in the Bible. It's all in the Bible. Can define your destiny. The enemy will do it for you. You don't even have to do anything. Just let him hit you like Isaac. Oh, I'm sorry. You don't want me to dig here? Okay, I'm going to keep moving. He digs some more. Oh, you don't like me here? Okay, man, this enemy is really bad. He's, I'm really missing my chances to really get my well and really be blessed. And they keep pushing me, keep pushing me until he finally arrives exactly to the place where God wanted him to be. If it had not been for the enemy, he would have always dug in the wrong place. Oh, God have mercy. Okay, okay, I got to quit. I really got to quit. Franco, quit. Can I have five more minutes and I'm going to close? Oh, God, it's nine o'clock. God, it's nine o'clock. I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I really don't preach so long. It's just, okay, okay, okay. Okay, let me say this and then we close. So why is it that Jesus had to become in flesh? You've got to go back to Genesis. Where in the beginning of time, God divided the kingdoms. We've got four kingdoms known to mankind. The animal kingdom the inanimate kingdom, our kingdom, and the underworld, the spiritual kingdom, four kingdoms known to mankind. He divided them, okay? Stay with me. This is going to be good. Divided them. And every kingdom was assigned with laws that cannot be violated. They are bound by those laws. In a few words, a lion cannot say, I want to become a human. A human cannot say, I want to become a butterfly. A fish cannot come out of water and say, I, I'm, I'm tired of being wet. I want to be dry now. It doesn't work that way, okay? Every kingdom is bound. The spiritual world cannot come into ours. Now, I, will, I could give you some really nice stuff there. 
Because I pastor multicultural people. Pastor, come to my house. There is a devil hiding in my walls. They can't. The only portals between the two kingdoms is a human. We're the only window through which they can come. Okay? It's all in the Bible. Now you understand this why. So you got these four kingdoms. And every kingdom is divided, regulated by these laws. Nobody can cross each one of them. Jesus couldn't cross it either. Or God couldn't cross it either. Because the spirit world cannot come into our world. In spirit, it's prohibited. And if they come, as Jesus did, you cannot operate anything. You cannot do anything. You are powerless. That's why Jesus, after his resurrection, couldn't do a miracle. He was already incorruptible. The reason why God had to rot himself and put on flesh is because he needed to do that. Just as he told Nicodemus when Nicodemus said, I want to be saved. What am I supposed to do? He, watch what he said. He said, if you want to enter into my kingdom, you have to be born again in water and in spirit. In a few words, that's what Jesus was saying. As I, as God, had to put on flesh to enter into your kingdom and understand the kingdom and be accepted of the kingdom. You have to put on spirit to come into mine. In a few words, you cannot enter in God's kingdom unless you are vested or you're dressed with the spirit of God. Just like Jesus had to put on flesh and walk into our kingdom in all, that's what people are confused about him. Is he a man or is he a God? Make no mistakes. He, of course, was dressed with flesh. But the eyes of Jesus were the piercing eyes of God, the movements of God. He was God person, uh, uh, in, in, in flesh. In a few words, yes, he walked like a man and he slept like a man. And he, but he acted like a God. Everything that he spoke, he was speaking to the spiritual realm. Anytime he addresses the wind, anytime he addresses the storm, read it in the original writings. He doesn't, he's not talking about the wind. He's not talking about the, the, the waves. He's talking about the spiritual living creatures. Read it. Read it, read it. Go to the Greek, original Greek. And, this, and, the, and the author, the scholars will tell there were living creatures. It wasn't just a wave because the words of God were speaking into the kingdom of God. What I'm trying to tell is this. You got to get the Holy Ghost because the only time, the only way you can enter into his kingdom is if you do what he did. He had to put on flesh to walk into our kingdom and you're going to have to put spirit to walk into his. Or you will never be accepted. You will always be a stranger and you will never understand why God came and you will never understand what the spirit world is all about. Never. And so Mary, here it is, my conclusion. So Mary is really puzzled. Because everything is going against her. Everything is going against her. Oh, but if you get Jesus, you get everything. Don't give up on God. Don't, don't let the world discourage you. Because everything is going to be supernatural. Everything you do for church, everything that you are acting upon in the house of God is going to play against you all the time. Because the world does not understand. I don't need you to make me. I don't need the world to give me supernatural, uh, a, a divine intervention. I don't need the world to understand what I'm carrying inside. I want to tell Mary, hold on, Mary, hold on. Don't let the baby go. Don't abort it. Don't do stupid things. Hold on to the promise. And I'm telling you, by the time this is over, by the time the seventh day, the seventh, the progressive, sequential work of God. When the baby comes out, you're going to look back and say, oh no, that was good. Because you'll never understand what you're in pain. You will never understand what creation is forming. You'll never understand the first day because it's chaos coming together into order. But if you wait, oh, if you wait, and then you wait, finally, when the baby is born, whoever gets Jesus gets everything. Once the baby is born, everything is going to turn to your favor because at the same time, while Joseph and Mary couldn't find it, a place to sleep, at the same time, while people, they felt rejected, isolated, no mother-in-law to help, no mother, no son, no baby shower, no nothing. Well, they were alone, isolated, only with a promise. The Bible tells me somebody knocked on their door, if they had a door. Three wise, willy, I mean, you talk about loaded with money, came and said, we are looking for who? Not for Mary, not for Joseph. I'm looking for Jesus. Do you still have the son? Do you still have the baby? Or do you just get rid of it? 
Because it was pain more than favor. You felt more stress than feeling blessed. Do you still have the baby? Because you had to wait this final day. You had to wait this process to be to end. To understand that we've been looking for him all this time. And finally we found him. And I want to tell you Mary. You don't have to go back to Nazareth with nothing in your pocket. You don't have to go back to Nazareth with no promise. Everything we have brought is going to be yours. Every incense, gold, myrrh, every uh, silver, every treasure that we have brought at your feet, we're bringing it to you, not because of who you are, Mary, and not because of who you are, Joseph, but we're bringing it to you because you still have the son. Because whoever gets the son at the end is going to get it. Stand with me. I want to tell everybody in this house, you better hold on to the baby. You better hold on to the Jesus. You better hold on to the son. You better don't, 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 don't quit. Don't, don't quit. Don't quit. I want to tell you, if you keep on preaching Jesus, if you keep preaching the truth, I'm telling you, they're going to be looking for you. They're going to say, we've been looking for you all this time. We just want to make sure. I want to tell you, if they hadn't had the baby, the treasures would have never been given because they didn't come for them. They came for him. I want to tell that the success of every church, the success of every Christian life is not dependent upon our good acts. It's dependent upon if Jesus still lives in this house. I want to tell everyone, preach Jesus. Love Jesus. Have a breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Have this house filled with Jesus. Worship Jesus. Praise Jesus. Pray Jesus. Keep the sun because if you keep the sun, everything else shall be added unto you. Come on, let's lift our hands and let's love him. Come on, is anybody in this house who understand? I got to put Jesus back where he belongs. I don't want to lose him along the way. I want to have Jesus. I need Jesus. Somebody is looking for Jesus. My promises are going to be fulfilled as long as I got him. Because without him, I cannot do anything. Would you step out of your chairs right now for just a moment? I know it's late. I'm sorry. Just come and stand here for a few moments and just give yourself to God and say, Lord, I need to reprioritize my life. I need to put my life back in order. Lord, I don't have, I haven't told anybody, God, but I really need you more than anything else. My career is important. My money is important. My family, of course, is important. But God, I don't want to leave you out. I don't want to leave you second. My church is important, but you're the most important thing in my life. I want to have you and I need you God come on whoever gets Jesus at the end is going to get everything the peace, the joy, the money, success, career finance, whatever that is Jesus Jesus is going to give it to you he shall hand it on to you but you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven come on would you lift up your hands young people, married couples, men, women whoever you are come on let's give our life back to Jesus Come on, you may grow a little cold, but it's all right. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I need that Jesus again. I don't want to trade it with anything else. Woo! Whoever gets Jesus gets everything. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. This auction is not over.